Amen. Thank you for opening us up in prayer. And if you have your Bibles, I invite your attention to Judges chapter number 8. Judges chapter number 8. We're uh, in the book of Judges. And uh, often Judges has some pretty spectacular moments, some moments that are just, uh, uh, if you will, over the top uh, with excitement and joy. And then there's some times in the book of Judges that are just uh, really unexplainable, how we try to reconcile them and we try to uh, figure it all out. And we just have to understand that God is the righteous judge and he's able to see from heaven's viewpoint. And he's able to interact uh, with the events of mankind, and he's able to bring justice in the long term. A lot of times we look at our lives, and we uh, we say, how can things get any uh, worse, and uh, where is the justice in all of it? And we have to understand that God does not see like we see. He doesn't look on the inward, or he doesn't look on the outward like man sees, but instead he looks on the heart, and he's able to see uh, when people with maybe the right motives do the wrong thing, and people uh, that even with uh, wrong motives just happen by accident to do the right thing, and then he can see when people uh, with a pure heart do the right thing, and so often he intervenes. Well, today we're going to look at life without God in the book of Judges. Now, we're not talking, it's not, in reality, we're never without God. We know uh, David in the Psalms, he said, uh, where, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said, where could I go where God's not there? Uh, If he went down in the depths of the sea, God's there. If he ascended uh, the heights of heaven, God is there. If he goes to the mountains and everywhere, all the different places where he could go, uh, there uh, God is with him and God is uh, holding him up. Well, and in, in, so we understand in the book of Judges that God is not absent, but God is absent certainly from people's attention and from their heart. Uh, this morning, uh, I told my young uh, people they were left alone temporarily for a very short amount of time, and I told them uh, that God is watching them in a very real way, and also that he has a helper called Mom. And mom has cameras, and mom at any given moment could be watching them. And uh, we, we act differently when we think we're being watched, don't you? I think it's interesting. I was reading about uh, doctors that uh, go in, and doctors, part of their job, uh, not a very fun job I would imagine, uh, is when you have little polyps in your colon, uh, doctors have to go in and clean those all out. And, uh, and it is uh, interesting, they found out that if... Uh, doctors knew that they were being videotaped while they were doing that procedure. The procedure often took 45 extra minutes. Why? They were being more thorough. They were being more careful. They were making sure not to miss a polyp, uh, not to miss uh, something that could cause uh, uh, problems because they knew that every single person that had to go through that procedure was going to be watching the video And I don't know why you'd want to watch that video uh, other than to make sure that your doctor was doing the right thing. Say all that to say this, we act differently when we're being watched. It ought not be so. We ought to to be the same. Uh, How you act at church ought to be the same that you act at home. And it ought to be, well, obviously we we act a little better at church. But I'm saying we ought to be consistent how we act everywhere because God is everywhere and God is watching. But the children of Israel lost sight of that. And an interesting time that they did it, the Bible says, And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made baal Berith their god. And, uh, and so understand this, uh, the, the Bible tells us when it happened, gives us that starting point. It came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead. Now, you can imagine uh, that's, when, that's when it all went down, but you can imagine that there were people ahead of time that had already had it planned. They had already decided, you know, uh, we've been following Gideon, and remember how Gideon, when he first became ruler, he said, I'm not going to rule over you, but God is going to rule over you. And we questioned, maybe there was a little bit of sincerity uh, there, but also at the same time, there might have been a little bit of, uh, if you will, over-the-topness on Gideon's part. 
But true to his word, it seemed like that during the life of Gideon, even though Gideon uh, didn't do everything perfect, and at the end of his life, we would say uh, that he seemed to kind of live like a king, even though he said that God was going to be their king. But at least during Gideon's time, God was God, and none of the other uh, idols would be accepted. It's not that that maybe it didn't happen. It's not that there weren't uh, there, but uh, it wasn't something that happened out in the open. It wasn't something that uh, the nation of Israel was going to allow. But Gideon, the Bible says, as soon, as soon as he left. Uh, You ever heard the phrase, uh, when the cat's away, the, the mice will play? When do they start to play? As soon uh, as as soon as the cat is away, as soon as the door is shut, as soon as the people go out, the mice crawl in and they find uh, whatever it is that little people have hidden in their dresser drawers that is edible. Keep your food downstairs in the pantry. Anyways, that's just an aside. But as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their God. That word Baal Bereth, it, it literally means a, a, a God or a deity of covenant and agreement. Rather than God who had sworn by himself and given them a covenant that if they would just follow him, that he would give them this land. They said, no, instead, we, wanna, we want a God that we can make our own agreement with. And so the Bible tells us in the next verse, The children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. You see, how does somebody go from uh, serving God, being involved in a a good, maybe an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist uh, church, how do they go from there... Uh, to being out in the world, to, uh, uh, to being on drugs maybe, or being in a immoral lifestyle. Can I tell you, it starts right here, the key, the Bible says, and the children of Israel remembered not the Lord, their God, that had delivered them. And I tell you, when we forget about what God delivered us from, and I don't know who you are, or I don't know, okay, I do know who everybody is here, but, but understand this, no matter what you've been saved from, whether it was maybe you were just a, a little child and you were saved from a lifetime of sin early, or maybe you were an adult who turned to the Lord afterwards and uh, you were saved from uh, afterwards from a lifetime, uh, mark it down. When we forget what we're saved from, that's when we begin to turn away from God. That's when we begin to allow other things to enter our life and, uh, and, and, to, and if you will, to rule us. And so the Bible says uh, he, they forgot uh, the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hand of, and I love this next phrase, all their enemies. There wasn't an enemy where God said, you know what, you're just going to have to do this one on your own. But instead, God delivered them enemy after enemy, city after city. The Bible says that they forgot. Romans chapter 1 verse 28 kind of maybe explains, it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It's interesting that word retain, it's from a Greek word that you might be familiar with, echo. The idea is that we say it over and over and over. Have you ever noticed that when your mom or your dad or maybe your boss at work or somewhere, they want you to remember something, what do they say? do? They say it over and over and over. How do we remember the goodness of God? Because we're a forgetful people. We, if, we don't, if something's not before us, it's real easy for us to forget about it. And, uh, and so they were supposed to rehearse the things that God had done to them, the blessings and the curses that God had promised. But instead, they decided not to retain God in their knowledge and to forget about all that God had done for them. And the Bible says in verse number 35, it says, neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbabel. That's talking about uh, Gideon's house, namely Gideon according to all the goodness which he had showed unto all Israel. That word, uh, he had not, they had not shown kindness. It's literally like a love and a loyalty that was due him. Gideon had delivered him and uh, had delivered Israel and his army had fought valiantly. And even after the big battle, they went and they chased the 10,000 men and God gave them uh, victory, even though they were uh, tired, even though they were weary and nobody else got behind them and they were risking their lives. 
And the Bible says that Israel forgot kindness. Can I tell you how we uh, can stray away from the Lord is forgetting what God uh, did for other people. But another way that we can get far from God is forgetting what is owed to other people. Uh, What do I mean? That God wants us to show kindness or to remember uh, the people that we need to love and show love to. And Israel forgot to do that. The Bible says in the very next verse, And Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem, unto his mother's brethren, and commune with them, and with all the family of the house of his mother's father. And so what they do, that word commune, when we look through the Bible, uh, it's not simply that he sat around and talked, uh, but you can just imagine they got around the table, and they had this uh, big meal, and it was this big to-do. In the very next verse, it says, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Uh, yeah, remember that God had established this principle. This wasn't just something that was made up. But Moses, uh, remember Moses got into a bind. And uh, if you remember back uh, with Moses and, and, and he's getting stressed out, he's having to rule the, rule the people, if you will. He's having to judge whenever there's a dispute, everything comes to Moses. So he goes to his father-in-law, and I believe it's uh, the Lord that he's given this uh, advice. He says, why don't you, you, you set rulers over all, of the, um, over all the people, and they'll be able, uh, the, the, the people will choose these people, and they'll be able to mete out judgment, and they're going to be people that are uh, qualified. And so Moses took that high road, and he established that 70 elders over Israel, and God, uh, in a form here, uh, I believe, may have allowed that Gideon was trying to follow that old path, that idea of, I'm not going to rule over you, I'm not going to uh, be the dictator, but instead I'm going to distribute it. Now, certainly we call into question 69 children uh, and, and lots of different wives, but here Abimelech, he's not just fighting against Israel, and he's not just fighting against Gideon, but he's fighting against God's plan, and God's plan was that distributed representative leadership that could be fair and impartial and instead he was here and he's trying to consolidate everything the bible says and his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of shechem all these words and their heart inclined to follow abimelech for they said he is our brother that word inclined uh it's interesting um there's, uh, how many of you have ever worked on an inclined bench? Uh, is it easier or harder than working on a regular bench? Depends on, if, on the bar, but in general, it's a little bit heavier. That word inclined, uh, it, it kind of gives us the idea when the Bible says that they uh, inclined is literally like this, they stretched out. What the Bible's trying to give us is they literally had to go out of their way to do this. They had to go out of their way to disobey God and His way. And so they inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of baal Bareth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. That word vain, uh, it literally means empty. Uh, have you ever noticed that there are certain people that they are empty, that their uh, that their lifestyle is just not filled with good uh, and wholesome things? If you ask them, hey, uh, what do you do on a regular basis? Where do you go on a regular basis? Who are your friends? It's just it's empty. That word light, it's interesting. Uh, it literally means like bubbling water. Have you ever seen uh, soda and the little bubbles that are inside it? And what happens very quickly? to soda that was just so good and so amazing and you drink it down quick and what happens when all the bubbles go away what happens when all the bubbles go away it's horrible you hate it and the idea there is it's kind of like when it when it talks about light it means kind of like a quick bubbling up something that it's like a flash in the pan it's there for a moment and then it's not people who could be bought for money the bible says and he went into his father's house at Ophrah, and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Just imagine this. You're killing all your brothers 
so that you can have control. Granted half-brothers, but all your brothers. And it's not just one and it's not just two. And the Bible says all on that stone. He was trying to, he was trying to instill fear. He was trying to show anybody that stands up against me, this is what's going to happen to you. But I love the grace of God, even in the midst of this moment, the Bible says, notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he hid himself. Can I tell you that sometimes the wisest thing that you can do is not to go try to fight the devil, is not to try to go and uh, fight temptation, is not to fight your enemy. Sometimes the best thing you can do is duck and hide and live to fight another day and to be able to be God's representative. Sometimes, sometimes, according to Judges chapter 9 and verse 5, it is better to just hide out. And so the Bible says that Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left for he hid himself. The Bible says, and all the men of Shechem gathered uh, together and all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that is in Shechem. And they told it to, and they, and when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lift up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. Where, uh, where is he right now? He, he, where is Jotham? He's, li- he's, not on, uh, he's not on Mount Ebal cursing them. He was on out, Mount Ebal blessing them and calling on them to claim the blessings of God. And you understand that they would, Israel would stand on uh, Mount, uh, Mount, they would stand on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and they would repeat back and forth the blessings and the curses. And he's calling on them and he's trying to be positive. And understand he could have been a, a bitter and hurt person right now because they just killed all of his brothers. But instead, he's calling on them and he's saying, call out to God and God wants to bless you. What a strong man. And, and Israel could have looked at that and said, here's a, here, and, and Shechem is what we're talking about. Shechem could have looked at them and all these men could have realized the, the error of their way and how here's a young man, the rightful leader of these people and how he's coming to them with the right kind of heart and he's calling on them to claim the blessings of God in their life. He says that God may hearken unto you. And then he gives them a story so that they can understand. He said the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go and be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and be promoted over the trees? And all the trees, then said all the trees unto the bramble, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto, unto the trees, if in truth ye appoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. The best I can piece together, the bramble is basically like a nasty blackberry bush. Can you imagine? Now, when I was a kid, I lived over in part of my growing up years in Paul's Bow. And in Paul's Bow, they have right next door <coughs> a place, uh, help me out, I'm going to say it wrong. It's, no, it's the reservation right between Paul's Bow, Suquamish. And in the Suquamish Indian Reservation that you could go through, even if you weren't an Indian, um, there were these blackberry bushes. And these blackberry bushes all along the sides of the road, uh, many places would have big signs that told the highway department not to spray the blackberry bushes. And so they would get blackberries, and I'm telling you, not like a blackberry is a blackberry. It's as big as it is, but it's made up of these little teeny things about the size of a little teeny pea. But can you imagine the biggest pea that you've ever seen and, uh, and a whole cluster of those, and that is a blackberry. Those are the kind of blackberries we like, right? 
When the Bible describes a bramble, we're talking about something kind of like a blackberry, but think with very little fruit. It's not even worth your while to go get your arms all skinned up uh, to get what that can produce. And the bramble, the Bible said, was what they chose to put over them. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely, and that you have made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbaal and his house, and have done according, uh, and and done unto him according to the deserving of his hands. For now, my father, for my father fought for you, and adventures his, his and adventured his life far, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons threescore and ten persons upon one stone. And have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of Abimelech, and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out of the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo, and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beir and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. That word Beir, it literally means, uh, I think it's interesting how God kind of gives little allusions, and I'm not trying to draw too much out, but Jotham, I believe he had just had a very dry time in his life. He had lost his brothers. And the Bible said he went to Beir, meaning a well or a, or a place of watering When Abimelech reigned three years over Israel, the Bible says God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dwelt treacherously with Abimelech. What happened? Oh, God didn't move right away. God didn't just send down fire and, and deal with it right at that moment. For a while, Jotham had to, to go out for about three years and he had to spend some time alone with God. But God was faithful. You know, a lot of times if we're not careful, uh, we say, God, why aren't you dealing with my problem right now? Why aren't you bringing a solution right now? Why am I not seeing justice right now? And sometimes if we're not careful in our mind, we begin to think of God and we begin to say, God, are you ever going to bring justice to this situation? Are you ever going to deliver me from this trouble that I'm in? But mark it down, God was faithful and he brought that evil spirit, that basically bad relationship now between the men of Shechem and between Abimelech and ended his life. The Bible says, and the cruelty done to the threescore and ten sons of Jerubal might come and their blood be laid upon Abimelech, their brother, which slew them upon, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. Notice the blame is on the people who actually committed the deed. It's on Abimelech and those vain and light persons. And the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him in the top of the mountains, and they robbed all that came along the way by them. And it was told Abimelech, for Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. And they went out unto the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. And Gal, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Is not, the son, is not he the son of Jerubbabel and Zebel, his officer? Serve the men of Hamar, sorry, serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him? And would to God this people were under my hand, then would I remove Abimelech. And he said unto Abimelech, Increase thine army and come out. And when Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled, and he sent messengers unto Abimelech privily, saying, Behold, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his brethren come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. Now therefore, up by night, thou and the people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, thou shalt rise early 
and set upon the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, then mayest thou do unto them as thou shalt find occasion. They had it all planned out. Here's how, here's how you're going to be able to double cross the double crossers. And you're going to be able to win Abimelech. And Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night. And they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, uh, went out and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. And when Gaal saw the people, he said to Zebul, Behold, there come people down from the top of the mountains. And Zebul said unto him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. And Gaal spake again and said, See, there come people by down by the middle of the land, and another company along by the plain of uh, Meonamim. Then said Zebul unto him, Where is now thy mouth, where thou saidest, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. And Gaal went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech, and Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many were overthrown and wounded, even into the entering of the gate. And Abimelech dwelt at Aram, and Zael thrust out Gaal and his brethren, that they should not dwell in Shechem. And it came to pass on the morrow that the people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech, and he took the people and divided them into three companies, and laid wait in the field, and looked, and behold, the people came forth out of the city, and he rose up against them and smote them. And Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields and slew them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. And he took the city and slew the people that were therein and beat down the city. And sowed it with salt. And when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into a hold of the house of the god Berith. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech got him up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, uh, what ye have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bough and followed uh, Abimelech and put them to the hold, and set the hold on fire upon them, so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died also, about a thousand men and women. And when Abim then went Abimelech to Thebes, and encamped against Thebes, and took it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and thither fled all the men and women, and all they of the city, and shut it to them, and gat them up to the top of the tower. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men may not say a woman slew him, and his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Notice this. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, in slaying his seventy brethren. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. Can I tell you what God is saying? That commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, guess how long it lasts? It lasts, people say, well, until they've passed away. You know what God says? God says he's rendering judgment for disobedience to honor thy father and thy mother. He is rendering judgment. At, he killed his brothers when? After Gideon was already dead. God says, my commandment, honor your father and mother, it, is, it just keeps going on as long as you're alive, as long as they're alive. When they've passed away, it's still my commandment. And that commandment, thou shalt not kill, it's universal. And God renders uh, unjustified killings. He rent the, the, 
Let's read it again. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father in slaying his, twin, his 70 brethren, and all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of, curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. How stupid can some people be? They set up Belbereth as their God, and they didn't remember the Lord their God, who had rescued them from the hands of their enemies over and over and over. Can I tell you, there is more stupidity. Uh, as one man said, there is more stupidity than hydrogen in the universe, and it has a sh longer shelf life. You know, we do stupid things every once in a while. You ever just stared in the refrigerator when you weren't even hungry? You just kind of stare there. Have you ever eaten something when you weren't hungry just because it was there? You know they make signs for stupid people? They literally, this is actually a real sign. I'll read it to you. Warning, this road crosses U.S. Air Force bombing range for the next 12 miles. Objects may fall from aircraft. And there are people that drive this road. There are people that just because there's a sign just because something told them to do it, they will buy anything. There were people that would slip and fall right next to a sign like this that warns them to be careful because there is a wet floor. You know, what are we trying to say? You don't, you don't have to be stupid. Just because everybody else is being stupid, you don't have to be stupid. Just because everybody else is jumping off the proverbial bridge, you don't have to jump off the bridge. Just because everybody's doing it. Can I tell you, Jotham stood up against literally a, 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 that whole area and God preserved him. And eventually God vindicated him. You don't have to be stupid. You don't have to go with the crowd is our kind of our point number one. Point number two is that there is a time to choose. Jotham, Gideon's uh, youngest, or Jerubbabel, either way you want to say it, his youngest son was able to hide from Abimelech's uh, killers and escape from being slaughtered. He kept a low profile until the day of that coronation, and then he stood up and he pointed to that crowd, and in a very, I believe, a very colorful testimony about the trees, he said, there is a time if you will, he basically was saying, you choose between letting Abimelech be your God and letting God be your God. This wasn't a choice between Jotham and Abimelech. This was a choice between Baal and God. And there was a time that they needed to choose. And notice he said this, hearken unto me, you men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. He's literally trying to call them back to God. And he's saying that God wants to bless you and God wants you to do right. Again, remember that port, the trees went forth on a time to appoint a king over them. He tells this parable and the people who had been listening and working. They understand these thorn bushes that, they, that he talked about, they weren't something that the people didn't know about. And they were something that had chided them and chided them over and over. And he's trying to bring a word picture to bring their hearts back to God. And he's saying, you need to choose and he said, if ye have dwelt truly and sincerely with Jerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. When your heart is telling you you've done the wrong thing, it's not too late. Can I tell you the lie that the people of Shechem believed? That's too late for me to do right now. And I tell you, if we're not careful, we believe that lie. You know, I'm, I've gone too far I might as well just continue on in whatever I'm doing. Can I tell you, it's never too late to stop. It's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late to make the right choice. And sometimes we, we believe that lie that either we've told ourselves or that the devil's told us that ah, it's just, I'm too far gone. I'm, it's just too late. The Bible tells us in John chapter 19 and verse 15, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Literally, Caesar was the very man 
whose rule they had longed to be freed from, but they were hailing him as their emperor. When people reject God, can I tell you, they don't choose freedom and they're not choosing their true leader. They are literally choosing their next taskmaster, their next slave owner. Can I tell you, America needs to turn back to God. And when they turn back to God, they'll have freedom. But when they turn away from God and they, and they put their faith and their trust in whatever, whoever it is that's going to lead their government, they're always going to go back into captivity. They're always going to go back into oppression. That's what Israel was doing. And that's what the chief priest did in John chapter 19. They're literally calling on their oppressors to try to save them. And the third thing, last thought, God is not mocked. The people rejected Jotham's warning and they made Abimelech king. But Galatians says God is not mocked. In verse number 57 of Judges chapter 9, the Bible says, And all the evil... Of the men of Shech- and all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. He realized that he was up there on that mountain, and he was pronouncing blessings and cursings. And they could have chose the blessing. Remember Moses, he stood up kind of in the same way. He says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. It's kind of like a multiple choice question with only two answers, and you know the right one. A or B, life or blessed, life or death, blessing or cursing. And I love Moses because he knows we're all stupid and we choose the wrong one, even when it's only a two point, only a two question, sorry, a two answer, multiple choice question, and we already know the right answer. He says, therefore, choose life. You know what, Jotham, I don't think he was out there trying to just pronounce the curse on those people. I believe that in, the heart of, in his heart of hearts, he wanted to see the men of Shechem turn in repentance toward God. He said, if you turn to God, God will hear you. Can I tell you that if we turn to God, God will hear us? God caused that conflict between Abimelech and the people of Shechem. They set up these raiding parties to ambush passersby and to try to uh, mess with, I think with really, the, I think the whole motivation was to try to mess with Abimelech and try to weaken him. And a man called Gal, and uh, I love how Lynn Wood, he describes him as a sort of uh, knight errand who moved through the country with a group of fellow knights to seize and uh, advantages and take opportunity. He arrives on the scene and he won the hearts of the people of Shechem and he uses his influence uh, to go after Abimelech. Abimelech And why would he go after Abimelech? So that he could put himself forward as the leader that everybody was waiting for. And so Abimelech's uh, Zebel, he tells him what's going on and he advises him. He says, uh, uh, if if you just get your fighters out there, remember he divided them into the four uh, different groups there and they were to lie in wait until uh, and attack Gal and his men when they came out of the city in the morning. And so Gal, he he crushes Abimelech's army on the next day and the people left of the city, uh, they go out to work in the fields and then they get all killed and, and then they attack the city itself and finally, just, just to insult, every, uh, they kill everybody and they burn the whole tower and then they sew it with salt. It's just kind of like the final, the final telling of Abimelech's heart. And after this, he thinks, what am I going to do? I'm going to go on to the next city. And I don't know how big exactly the millstone. You know, millstones, they make small millstones and big millstones. You actually, I've seen millstones that can be turned around by a hand crank. I've seen millstones that take two men or two women. And I've seen millstones that take horses. But this woman, I don't know if she was this big, strong woman or this teeny little woman, but she took the thing that she had. She didn't have a bomb. She didn't have a sword. She had a millstone. And she was willing to contribute it to the effort. And what did she do? She threw it over and it hit him. I don't know if it just, how exactly, but her intention was to drop it on his head and for him to be dead. And God guided it in such a way that it hit him 
and he was almost dead. And so what does he do? He, because he doesn't want everybody to say that a woman killed him. He says, why don't you come and stab me to his armor bearer? So what does his armor bearer do? His armor bearer comes, the Bible says, thrusts him through. Why? So that nobody will say that he got killed by a woman. How'd he die, class? He had a millstone that dropped on his head and he died. And I tell you that nothing goes unnoticed by God. No injustice is left unpunished. Abraham said it like this, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I love it how Abraham had such a relationship with God and he knew so much about God. He says, I know you're not going to destroy the righteous and the wicked at the same time. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Do we live a life that says that the outcome of my life is not determined by chance random processes, but that I am fully reliant on that question? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Can I tell you over and over and over, the judge of all the earth has stepped in in the affairs of mankind. He did it in Shechem. He did it in Shinar. He did it over and over. That's the story of the Bible. God intervening in the affairs of mankind. When the world was at its darkest time, Jesus literally stepped into the city of David to let people know that, yep, there's still hope and the righteous judge still visits his people and there's going to come a day when Jesus Christ comes to this earth. He'll take, he'll avenge his own he'll take his own and seven years later he'll come back and his foot will come down onto the mount of olives and it's going to cliff and there's going to be some major shakings and the judge of all the earth is going to do what's right do we live like the judge of all the earth could come back tonight do we live like that the judge of all the earth is able to right the wrongs of my life with their heads bowed and their eyes closed. Father, I'm so grateful that Jotham showed the faith of Abraham that you were able to bless people if they would turn to you and you were able to curse people and destroy them when they would raise their hand against you and against your rulers and against your people. I pray that we would have that same kind of commitment that we would believe that the righteous judge of all the earth is going to do what's right. We ask these things in Jesus' name.